I have to say that Husqvarna shop tools really make a difference on this. And this is a puller pretty much set up for the 576. And the reason why you have to go to these kind of measures is because the crank has got stuffers. So you can't reach in through the top of the case like you can with a C style splitter. And uh, yeah, that bearing needs to get replaced. They get hot like that, they eventually have that nylon crumble. So while it's not failed at this point in time, um, I'll feel better about life by putting a new bearing in there. And to get it off the crank, because it was pretty tight, Harbor Freight yet again, you know, these kind of tools here may not be all that expensive, but there are times when this really, really, really saves your backside. So I'm going to use that puller to pull that bearing off. And then uh, I'm going to do what I normally do by heating the cases up and dropping bearings in, taking this one out. By the way, this one was a complete failure, right? You know, it's, it's kind of deceiving because believe it or not, even while it's like in that condition, it turns smooth. So if you just use the old smooth test to see whether or not that bearing had, had failed, uh, you wouldn't pick up on it. And the reason why I'm going to replace the bearing in this case anyway is because of the way the balls are, that thing is running a, a little bit of an eccentric. So that means it's been wobbling around on the inside of that bearing now for quite some time. So that was enough for me to decide to pull the bearing out and pull the seal and replace them. So. Harbor Freight to the rescue. Hit this with water and chill it down fast. Now yeah, do the same thing on the other side. That's the bearing that goes on the other side, OEM. Yet again, I'll get it pretty warm. And once I get it warm enough, Yeah, yet again, I'm going to go right for the water, chill it right down. Ratchet it up, and he has done exactly that. Now he has Sexton in his sights from third. This is where it starts to get a little bit interesting because if you... These are a little bit unique. The thread that's on these is a little bit different than the standard 372s. So, in this case here, I don't really have any of my special tooling, so I'm going to have to use the Husqvarna shop tools, oh shucks. But that's a different, uh, different thread. This is the shop for, for this particular one. It's designed to pull on the case versus the inner race. But you can go either way. And what it depends on is whether or not you have the seal in or not. And I use the OEM gasket. I'm going to use the shop tool puller and then what I'll do is I'm going to put the seal on after. I'm not going to put the seal on um, before. But the other thing I'm going to do is just put a couple of these screws in to line things up. Not to pull the cases, just to line them up. 
And some of these have a habit of having the screws back out. So I find it sometimes advantageous to put in just a little tiny bit. Little tiny bit of, of the 1184. And you have to make sure you have the locating pins in, and I do. There's a review. Did a thin film of this. I put a little bit of this on each of the case screws. Put the case screws in like finger tight, and that was more to align them than anything else. And uh, then it's just the same old routine. Pretty good to me. And I guess at this point you just kind of wind in the screws. Should be ready to come apart, right? What do we have here? A little bit of steam going on. It smells like turkey. Not really. Instead of using a heat gun, if you got something like this, this can be a whole lot more efficient. Let's take a look inside. What do we have for temperatures? 357. This is a 390. It just rocked out. I don't know if you noticed, but I got it up a little bit more than 300 degrees this time. The bearing just fell right out of it. And again, the anvil that I use has just got to be the same diameter as that. And again, if you have the temperature up, it's just a matter of setting it in there. Maybe a little tap, but it shouldn't be uh, an interference enough to matter. It should just drop right in if you have enough temperature couple of unusual shop operations I think. One is peeling the bearing off crank and the theoretical types will come up with a gazillion reasons why this doesn't work but let's just see what happens. And basically what I've got here is I've got a bearing puller and I put the knife edge behind the, the bearing and then I crank down on the thing, uh, get a good bite and then take a puller and just try to pull that bearing right off the crankshaft. And part of the reason I'm doing that is because I've got a set of cases that I've got to put a decent crank in. And uh, that bearing is moving quite easily, by the way. It's already moving. 
just by me doing this operation, cranking down on it, it's already kind of moving. It's right in there behind that. Right? And this is how I pull them off. Usually x torques because usually x torque is where the case gets pounded out, and I believe this probably came off an x torque where the case get pounded out on the PTO side, PTO side, and then when you pull the, the saw apart, the bearing is still on the crank because the case bearing pocket has been beat to the point where it can no longer hold the bearing with any resistance, you know? So that's the, that's the backdrop, I guess. And then, again, this is a Harbor Freight tool. And uh, while not the best quality in the world, it's good enough to do this kind of operation. What else we got going on? I set this to 300 degrees. Got a couple of case halves in there. Virtually brand new. And what I want to do is get rid of those nylon cage bearings. Put my money where my mouth is and put a couple of steel cage bearings in their place. So when these things get up to 300 degrees, I'll pop them out of there and uh, just drop the bearings out and put new ones right in. All right, let's see whether or not 320 degrees, it's actually about 300 degrees, lets us perform this operation on these cases. Yep, that's one out. I'm going to set it back in there. Then I'm going to bring it up to 350. See if they do. I want them to drop out. I don't want them to have to be driven out at all. Got to wait for that blue light to turn off. So let's take a look and see what we got for temperatures. So that's not 300 degrees. Even though the dial says it is, we're still at 296, 97. I found you almost have to get to 300 degrees in order for that bearing to drop out. So I'm going to let this go for a little bit. 300. The switch on here is about 20 degrees off. So right there. When I'm saying 300, it's only 280. When I'm saying 325, it's 300. Somewhere in that range, that case is just going to release that bearing. And I'll be able to drop one of these semi-ceramics from Definitive Dave over at uh, Chainsaw, whatever he calls himself. All right, the light's out. So let's see what the, the temperature is now on those pieces. That is 350, 369 degrees. So that should drop right out. And uh, so let me take this one first. Now that's a little more than I need. That's what I was looking for where there was effectively no resistance. So let's see whether or not we can drop the other bearing right in. Yep, there it goes. I'm going to do both these cranks. I found a better crank, by the way. This one's definitely tighter than the other one. The other one's all right. I'll go with the better feeling one to me. So this is what I do, again, on my own saws. We're going to test out these bearings. I have no idea if they last at all. They're a semi-ceramic. And their claim to fame is having the balls be sort of a, a ceramic, they're less susceptible to heat issues. And I am somewhat a skeptic as to whether it matters because I've really had no failures on conventional steel cage bearings on any of the saws I've ever put together, ever. So, you know, it's kind of like that whole thing with pistons. You see these guys spend a hundred bucks on a on a forged piston for a saw that's running within stock parameters in terms of RPMs. And it makes no sense. 
I made a point in this series right here of using the VEC branded pistons, which are, are actually they're not branded VEC, they're made by VEC, but they're branded golf or in this case Little Red Barn. And the reason I did was I wanted to make a point that for the things that we do, spending the kind of money that some of these guys are putting into these special pistons is just a waste. It's bling. It's not really add a whole lot of, of either performance or longevity to your saw, but you can say, hey, I got one of those pistons in my saw and feel pretty good about it. That's about what it's good for, you know? So I'm going to do the PTO side first and drop it right in. Pay attention to how the rod is because if you start pulling that rod where it's laying over into the case, you're going to pull it right through the case, bend the rod, and do damage to your cases. Now, in this scenario here, I'm going to use that bushing because that bushing allows me to push on the inner race of the bearing, you know? And that, in this particular scenario, is going to stress it less. Now, of course, had I put the seals in, well, then that doesn't work because you have to push on the case itself. But I didn't put the seals in yet, so this is going to work just fine the way I have it right here. So let me thread this onto the crank until it bottoms out. And now what I'm doing is I'm uh, putting a force on the inner race of the bearing itself and then just uh, having the bearing inner race under pressure as I pull the crank right through it. This one's going kind of easy. And with this hand here, I'm going to hold that connecting rod so that as I pull the crank in, the connecting rod is not going to interfere with the, the case, the gasket sealing surface of the case. I'll just wind this right in. Yeah, I've done this a whole bunch of times on video. And the funny thing is that I've done it so many times, but oftentimes I just show it in, in high speed motion, assuming that everybody knows exactly what and why I'm doing. And uh, I started getting some questions about, well, geez, how do you center the crane? You know, some ancillary stuff like that that I just assumed people had figured out. Apparently not. And uh, it's not a bad question. It's, it, it's just you can't make those assumptions because, you know, I've been doing this kind of thing for 40-something years. And stuff that you take for granted if you've done this all your life, you just can't assume that somebody who's getting into this for the first time is just going to intuit that. You know what I'm saying? Some will, but some won't. And it's not that anyone's stupid or anything like that. It's just a lot of this stuff is not readily obvious to people not all the time so let's turn around and get the other side now notice i have the connecting rod so it kind of rattles in there now so we're good i've got the locating pins right there that gasket's sitting on a little bit of uh 1184 which is kind of unnecessary but it's something i do and the other thing i noticed is i got to be a little careful of if you look right inside there the bar stud begin to walk out so before i put this half on there i'm going to tap that bar stud it through to make sure it's seated let me just get this set, set right in there what i'll often do is I'll drop these screws in just to align, not uh, not to squeeze, just aligning the screws. Let me just set a couple of them in there.
So some of the protocol that I could get away with with a steel bearing, I'm not sure I can with this, the ceramic. All right, so let's start with this. That feels smooth. Now, one of the things you get with my tools is I've been adding more material on the end right there so that I can actually tap them, you know, and not damage them. And the reason you do that, if you want to center the crank a little more sophisticated than, than just by eye, I mean, I can do it by eye, I'm pretty close. Well, it looks to me like it's pushed that way just a little bit. Um, maybe you can see where it's a little bit too far that side. So we need to tap it over. Now, if you want to do it correctly, just get yourself some stack of feeler gauges. Um, you know, I kind of know where it's going to end up, so it's not fair. And this is 21,000, so you need to find a 20 or 18 thousandths. These cases are a little bit different than what I've seen. Here's a 20, 20 thousandths. 19 thousandths. Very slip fit there. So I'm going to do a tap with a 19 thousandths. It's a slip fit both sides. So to be honest with you, when I get that kind of a same kind of a feel both sides, by stepping down until when I tap on the one side and it snugs up against the feeler gauge, that I can take that feeler gauge and do a slip fit on both sides of the crank. Visually it looks good. That's good enough. You know, I got roughly 19 or 20 thousandths a side on both sides. You're not going to get it any, you know, more centered than that where it matters. That's pretty much all you got to do. Well, probably fortunately for you, uh, not so much me, I don't have the PTO seal for this case, so I have to stop at the uh, flywheel side. And what I like to do is get oil in there. Don't like putting them together dry and a little bit of oil on the seal outside itself so it's a little bit lubed up. Set it right in there. I kind of turn it as I go in. And I've got a driver. And I've got it to where it's, it's uh, it drives it to a, a kind of a preset depth. There it is. And this basically drives it so it, when it hits the case, it's as far as it's going to go. So it drives it easily. But if you're if you're really observant, look closely at that that pin. This is an OEM crank from that period of time. And see how much thicker it is than a standard crank that you're used to seeing now? The inside diamond of that pin is quite a bit larger on the X-Torx. I don't happen to have one here. Or I'd show you this is still an original edition crank. This one actually came out of a XPW 51.4. And I believe this one here came out of a 65cc machine. And then, again, I have a hand that's kind of free. And I've said this a gazillion times before, but there's a technique where if you have a little pressure on the crank, you can do something called tapping the crank. And you set that all the way to the bottom. And all this does is it sets a vibration through the system, makes things sort of release for a second, and they settle out. Kind of a shock thing.
And then I'll go do the same on the other side. Alright, it ran out of battery, but I don't know how much I got on film, but I split the cases with this. Pretty much the standard way the crank came out. This saw has got a lot of time on it. And one of the things I notice is if you look at that crank, that's a groove worn into that thing. You know, on the bearing seal, I don't know if that'll ever seal again. What made the saw come to a stop is going to be very familiar to you. See all the balls have all run to one side there? Doesn't that kind of look like a 372 Husqvarna? Look at that thing wobble in there. Holy crow. And guess what? There's the flywheel side, and that's a nylon cage bearing. But not only is this a nylon cage bearing, but it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven balls. I'm going to make another short video. Um, this is another Harbor Freight Saves the Day video. And that is, I had to buy this blind hole bearing puller set from Harbor Freight. The model number is 95987. And what it basically is, it has these uh, devices right here where when you turn that in, you see how these spread? They grab on the inside of the bearing, whatever it is you're trying to pull, and then you attach this to the slide hammer and, and, and take out the bearing. That's what it looks like. I just by hand have got that turned in there and it's up it's up pretty tight. So at this point I'll, I'll put on the slide hammer. I'm not going to do it right now because I have to heat things up. And the slide hammer attaches there. And then once I have that stabilized you take the slide hammer and, and take the bearing out. Basically what I've been seeing is on these X torques is the clutch side bearing goes and the common denominator to this point in time is that those clutch side bearings were these nylon caged bearings and what that means is that little structure on the inside of that bearing which holds the balls apart is a nylon structure versus a steel cage and I guess what I gotta do now is take these two cases and heat them up and then try to slide hammer out those bearings and then I'll show you the results. Well, that was easier than I thought. I actually uh, just warmed it up. Just held it with one hand and slid out the other one about four or five taps later. There it is. Get this one off of here. So that's one down. Now, a sane person would have a wrench, but I'm kind of excited. I just got this damn thing home, and I'm wanting to see if I can make it work. Caught it. Like I said, it's not optimal, but there you go. I don't recommend doing it the way I just did it on a table like this, but like I said, I was pretty excited about the tool. I nearly sent that case right through the window. Can you imagine me trying to explain that to my wife? So, but again, you can see how this works. All right, let's test this darn thing on a set of puzzle cases. See, that sets right down in there nice. And this side right here sets right there. My recommendation would be take the heat gun and just put a little temperature into the bearing and then make sure there's some oil. We're going to do oil on both the bearing and the uh, crank. You know, make sure there's a... I like to make sure there's oil inside that nylon too. So basically oil that up first. And let's put this thing together and see if it works. You wind that right on there, like this, until it bottoms out.
remember it's a reverse thread I backed it off now you're kind of right there ready to go and then start pulling it right through now what I'm hoping is that the bushing helps the seal by not letting the, the lip of the seal to uh, prolapse and come out. It's part of the exercise here is to see whether or not this arrangement allows you to, to use the existing seals. You got snow coming off the roof making a hell of a racket. One thing I can tell you is using the handle like that just makes this so much easier. Turn that a little bit. That's the other thing I get with my handle like that is I can turn the crank as I start getting towards the seal. You know? To help that crank work its way through that seal. So that worked beautifully. Well there you go. There's the bushing off and there's the crank and it went right through that seal with no problem. You know we've gone through the whole thing about gaskets and all that. I'm just going to take this with the gasket on it like this. We're just going to pull this, this side together. I'm not going to use any 1184 or anything like that. I'm just going to put these together. This is as much about demonstration as it is about reality. Okay, now, now instead of using the big end, uh, I want to use the small end to kind of reach inside there on those 660s. Wind that on until you pretty much get to the bottom. Now that I've got my one hand free, I can control that connecting rod, make sure it's where it's supposed to be, and basically also control the case halves a little bit if you need to, and just wind it, wind it in. Well, there it is. It went right together, pretty much. And that's how you get your cases together. That's really about it. I'm not sure how much this is going to show, but I got first cut at the driveway. And we literally have feet of snow here. But I'm cold. I'm going to get out of here and go warm up. It's a hell of a snow shovel right there.